Welcome to an IGET concept module. IGET is a National Science Foundation funded project to promote remote sensing education. This concept module focuses on unsupervised and supervised techniques for classifying remote sensing data. This concept module begins with a question. How do we translate satellite data into useful information? A good starting point for addressing this question is the scene you're looking at here which was derived from the Landsat 8 satellite's Operational Land Imager, or OLI, sensor when it flew over Billings, Montana on June 2nd of 2013. Right off the bat, you can likely recognize a few of the patterns in this data that suggest how land in and around Billings is used. For example, in the northeast corner, you might recognize the shapes, spatial arrangements, tones, and relationships of the objects here relative to other parts of the image to have attributes that you might associate with urbanization. Heading west, you might notice new patterns suggesting a more residential landscape. Even farther west, the attributes of the image suggest more agricultural land use. Using these visual interpretation techniques to classify each of the more than one million pixels in this image, however, would be incredibly tedious and time consuming. It kind of makes your brain and mouse hand ache thinking about it, doesn't it? This concept module is designed to introduce you to two classification techniques commonly used in remote sensing to help you classify satellite imagery without experiencing quite as much brain and mouse hand ache. These techniques are unsupervised and supervised classification. As we move through the module, we'll use this Billings, Montana data to illustrate the basic elements of and differences between the two approaches. First though, we need to be sure that we're on the same page regarding the definition of classification. In remote sensing, classification is a workflow that permits you to group pixels with similar spectral characteristics together into classes. The process of classification helps you identify patterns in the data and helps add meaning to your data. In a nutshell, when you classify remotely sensed data, you convert the digital number associated with each pixel into membership in one of several classes that have more meaning than the digital number alone. Keep in mind that each pixel represents the amount of electromagnetic energy reflected by that 30 by 30 meter square of the Earth's surface at a particular wavelength. We can return to Billings, Montana to illustrate this point. Consider the pivot irrigation in the central part of this image. Imagine that this red box represents a 30 meter by 30 meter pixel. In truth, it's a little bigger than that. Now imagine how the pixel values, digital numbers for this pixel, in other words, the pixel's spectral signature, might look. Actually examining these values is a topic for another concept module. For now, note that this pixel's, this pixel's spectral signature will be similar to some of the pixels in the scene and different from others. Also, Using your image interpretation skills, you can likely come to the conclusion that this particular surface is not currently under cultivation. We could even go so far as to classify it as fallow. In classifying the pixel as fallow, we have essentially converted the digital number associated with it into a more meaningful category of data. We've gone from numbers to a qualitative description. In what follows, we'll compare and contrast unsupervised and supervised approaches to doing this sort of translation or classification work. We'll start with unsupervised classification. To help us understand how unsupervised classification works, we'll focus on this new development on the west end of Billings, a subdivision known as Ironwood. Here we've blown our Ironwood study area up so we can see more detail. We'll also add a grid representing the 30 meter by 30 meter pixels. Keep in mind that the grid and pixel size here are not to scale. They've been distorted in order to simplify our discussion of classification. If you look closely at the image, you can discern individual pixels, which are in fact 30 meters by 30 meters. Right away, when you look at this study area, you'll notice a few different surfaces. There's residential, sparse vegetation, and golf course. You'll also notice that the pixel boundaries here don't coincide with the boundaries of these surfaces. This is an issue we'll discuss at the end of the video. For now, let's focus on unsupervised classification. In unsupervised classification, the analyst specifies how many categories she would like the remote sensing software to create. The software then organizes these pixels into a designated number of categories. In this example, let's assume that the analyst has specified five categories. Put another way, 
with unsupervised classification, the analyst tells the software to group each pixel in a scene into a specified number of bins. Let's watch how this works for the Ironwood study area. First, we have to get our pixels ready for classification, and then we have to tell our software how many classes we want. In this case, we've already specified five classes. The software will then group the Ironwood pixels into these classes based on the spectral signature of each pixel. The software analyzes the spectral signature of the first pixel and places it in one of the five classes. This class is then assigned an identity based on its spectral signature. In this example, that identity is represented by a color, the color gray. As the classification process progresses, this identity acts as a membership profile. To get into this container, or class, future pixels must fit the profile associated with it. In other words, they must have spectral characteristics similar to the first pixel. The software then moves on and analyzes the second pixel. Depending on how similar this pixel is to the identity assigned to the first pixel, the software groups it together with the first pixel or in a separate class. For this example, let's assume that the second pixel gets grouped into a new class. The identity of this class is represented by a new color, brown. After analyzing this third pixel, the software determines that the spectral signatures of the pixel are very similar to pixel 1, and so it goes into the gray container as well. Same with the fourth pixel. The fifth pixel, however, has a distinct signature characterized by the healthy vegetation of the golf course. As such, it goes into a new bin. Same with the sixth pixel. The seventh pixel feature surfaces that we haven't seen yet. The new signature is represented here by green and brown. The eighth pixel signature fits well with the gray bin profile. The final pixel doesn't really fit with the others that well, so it gets its own category, though in reality it may be better fit with the gray category. For the purposes of this exercise, we'll assume that the little chunk of golf course alters pixel's signature enough that it is grouped into a sec separate category. The results of unsupervised classification, then, is that the pixels in Ironwood are grouped into the five classes we specified. In this slide, we can see how this might look. Note that no meaning other than the class identity, represented here by colors, has been assigned to these classes. The next step in an unsupervised classification would be for the user to assign meaning to these classes. Here is an example of the meaning that could be some of the meanings that could be assigned to each class. Here are some takeaway points regarding unsupervised classification. In unsupervised classification, Criteria for classification are the number of categories specified and the spectral signatures of the pixels in the scene. The categories are given meaning after the pixels in the Landsat scene have been organized into a quantity of classes specified by the user. The user is in charge of assigning this meaning. At times, unsupervised classification may force the user to create new or unwanted categories. For example, the sparse vegetation slash residential category in the left central portion of our grid. This pixel may actually fit better with the residential pixels, but the little chunk of golf course, for the purpose of this example, gets it moved into a different category. In other words, some pixels that don't fit neatly into the categories that your remote sensing software creates but, which may be interesting to the remote sensor, may, for want of a better word, be absorbed or assigned unintentional meaning during the classification process. In, in practice, it is typical to run multiple supervised classifications to test what number of classes is the best fit for the data you are interested in. For example, you could run an unclassified workflow on this data here using two classes and run a second unclassified workflow using 12 classes. What you will likely observe in your results is that neither is a good fit. Two classes doesn't provide enough containers to effectively classify, 
the different types of surfaces in your scene, and so the pixels will end up being misclassified. 12 classes has too many bins, and so like with the two classification or two class solution, the pixels get inappropriately classified. After examining your results and experimenting with different class different numbers of classes, you can begin to narrow down and arrive at the an appropriate or best fit number of classes. In supervised classification, pixels are classified based on a training sample created by the user. Here's how this looks. First, the grid is, we'll remove the grid to get started. I'm doing this to make the point that supervised classification starts with features and landscapes the user is interested in identifying. In other words, supervised classification starts with categories that also have already have meaning to the user. We'll start with the creation of a training sample. Training sample is a series of polygons that is used by remote sensing software to classify the pixels in a particular scene into categories identified by the user. From our previous encounter with unclassified, unsupervised classification, we know something about the surfaces in this sample area. They are golf park, sparse vegetation, and residential. In other words, we know what surfaces we're looking to classify. In supervised classification, the remote sensor traces the boundaries of the surface they are interested in classifying. The remote sensing software will use the value of the pixel, pixels or pixel in this case, inside of each training sample to classify other parts of the scene. Here's a sneak preview. Once the training sample is complete, or at least once samples have been gathered for each of the categories the user is interested in, the remote sensing software will classify each pixel based on how similar to or different from the training sample each is. We're getting ahead of ourselves, though. Consider the example of the golf course training sample. In this example, we can get the whole golf course, trace its bound, the whole boundaries of the entire golf course. Keep in mind that for the results of supervised classification to be useful, it's best to create multiple training samples for each type of surface you're interested in classifying, and that you should do this for multiple location, locations, not just in an isolated corner of your image as we've done here. In other words, for classification to be effective in a real, ex real case, remote sensing case, you need to classify other golf courses and parks in the scene. Second sample is sparse vegetation. For example, consider in the upper right corner the Gulf Highlands golf course. The second sample is sparse vegetation. We'll create multiple training samples for sparse vegetation. The third sample is residential surfaces. They're all over the scene, so we can also easily create multiple training samples here. In practice, this process of creating training samples and running test classifications on them is done multiple times. Here's how the results of our classification might look. Note that we've highlighted two instances where the pixel, the values of the training sample pixels might not align perfectly. The golf park pixel in the center of our grid and the unclassified pixel in the bottom right corner. These are pixels where the attributes of the surfaces contained by the pixels doesn't permit easy classification in the classes we've identified with our training sample. Here are the takeaway points for supervised classification. The classification criteria for supervised classification are the spectral signatures of the pixels contained or included in user-created training samples. Meaning is assigned to these classes prior to classification of the Landsat scene by the user. The same problem occurs in supervised classification as in unsupervised classification, however, in that new or unwanted classes may be created, or, as in the case of the unclassified pixel in the bottom right corner of our grid, some pixels simply won't have a spectral signature that permit them to be classified with those in uh, the training sample. Here are takeaway points regarding both supervised and unsupervised classification. One takeaway point is that there are unavoidable gaps between the pixel boundaries and the boundaries of the features you're classifying. This means that the results of your classification will always be imperfect. That said, classification does permit us to examine and quantify important patterns in the landscape. 
here are some questions for you to consider as you begin to explore supervised and unsupervised classification. Here are some references that will help you as you begin to get more advanced and explore more opportunities for classification.